Hey, good, grab your Bible. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Psalm here in a moment. I'm going to set it up a bit. We're in the a series, perhaps you know this, even if you're new, uh, they were calling it Real Life, uh, how to get through what you're going through. We're looking at uh, real life struggles. I mean, we always do that, but really here, the Psalms just just scream at us and are so honest and open. We started a couple of weeks ago talking about mental health. We're trying to normalize conversations around depression and anxiety that, that we all struggle with in varying degrees. And last week we talked about exhaustion, which kind of leads into uh, this week's message. Uh, we're going to talk about spiritual apathy and indifference because we all go through seasons like this. And right now we talk about this often. I want to set this up and from a macro level, we are walking through some seismic shifts in our culture. Uh, we'll talk about how we don't need to respond with fear, but it is true. Uh, even in my lifetime, we've not quite seen what's happening. A tumultuous backdrop that can, uh, that can really create within us our own personal struggles, um, can be amplified. I think, um, Phyllis Tickle, uh, yes, last name Tickle, great name, um, theologian, author, uh, she was the um, head of, or really the founding department head of the religion section of Publishers Weekly, if some of y'all remember that. But she wrote a book about 20 years ago, I think I read this book about 15 years ago, um, called The Great Emergence, um, How Christianity is Changing and Why. And I want you to think with me, again, from a macro level to get us focused in today, um, she says, she offers a framework that says that every 500 years, the church goes through a seismic shift, might be a cultural shift, the results of things going on in culture, or it may be an ecclesiological or theological shift that takes place. Think about this. She says, of course, the catalytic moment, the Kairos moment is the Christ event. Christ came, God comes to us in the person of Jesus. And he lives the perfect life. He dies on the cross for our sin. He's raised again. And then 500 years later, if you know much about history, church history, so around the year 200, you know, Constantine makes really the church becomes, the Catholic church becomes a state church. By 500, we see the fall of Rome and the church becomes the prominent influence in, in the world. Now, interestingly, that leads us to the dark ages, we call it. Then 500 years later, 1000 AD, anybody? 1054 is the date of the great schism between the church in the West, we got the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox, the Byzantine Church, and we see this split, and that was a theological and ecclesiological split, okay? So you see this great upheaval, which set a new course for the church. Then 500 years later, this is rather fascinating, 1500, anybody? The great, Reformation takes place. Yeah, some of you know that 1517 is the date when he nailed the theses, 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church that sparked the Reformation. D radical shift, right? And which is why we're here in part today. Those you protesters um, who came against the church Protestants who now really the sola, right? The five solas of the Reformation that drive so much of what we do today. Now, I say all that because now 500 years later, I don't know where you were 2017 to mark the 500 year mark, but over a season, all this has fuzzy edges on it. But we're now walking through, in my lifetime and many sociologists, historians say, a major shift. A lot of that has been brought on by a global pandemic, unlike anything we had ever seen. In the American church, and this is really the church across the, the world, but certainly in the American church, there's been what many have called the great sort. The great sorting out of the American church. I've described it as the refining of God's church in America. With all that's taken place, think about what's happened since 2017. Think of all that has happened just over the past five, 10 years. In the marketplace, that's led to what many have called the great resignation. And many are wrestling now businesses, what they call uh, quiet quitting of employees who show up, still, still getting there, sort of, not coming to the office always, but we're doing just enough to get by. Now, this is not true about all of us, certainly, but many say that we now live in the age of apathy. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Some I've laid out, but we live in this culture of immediacy. If it doesn't come quick, 
Whatever I want or my health or something, if it doesn't come fast enough, I'm, I'm out. Leads to indifference and apathy. Some have said now what we thought would be the roaring 20s are actually what many are calling, particularly Gen Z and, and younger crowds, saying, We're, these are the realistic 20s. They now are saying, and then research bears this out, they're not going to have the lives that their parents had. Many Gen Z think that they're, they're a lot less optimistic. 70% of them believe that they'll have more trouble than their parents saving money, buying a house someday, going to college, all the things. Now, Megan just got back from a trip where she's with college students often, as I am often as well. Certainly not everybody is on a pessimistic trend here. I have great hope in this generation. But for all of us, I think the macro problems of the world that serve again as a backdrop, we have this immediate connection with all that's happening in the world. And if you're not careful, and I've talked to several of of us, particularly um, some, some elder, more mature ones among us. I talked to someone on Friday night at an event we had with our seniors, our boomers, um, with our friend Pete Delkus, had an incredible time uh, in the great hall together. But we, I was talking to some who said, you know, I've stopped watching news altogether, at least news channel. I can't handle it. I don't want to hear any more of it. I, I want to be saturated by the truth of what's happening. And someone said, well, don't you need to know what's going on in the world? Well, yes, but there's a place to to receive that kind of information. What I'm saying is this. Christians are not immune to indifference and apathy that can be brought about by the overwhelming sense that, that all is not well in the world. We live with hope, however. And today I want to talk about this. And I want to ask you the question, kind of funnel down to where you are. Are you in a place, are you experiencing spiritual apathy? Or indifference in your life today. Now, again, I'm not trying to create this in you, but some of us really are, if we're honest. And we all have been in seasons like that. In fact, let me just say it I, I think it's normal in the Christian life. Our passion for Jesus, unfortunately, it ebbs and flows. What do you do about that? There's good news. You don't need to stay there. And today you came on the right day because one of the things I want to challenge us with before I get to the text. As people have been slow coming back to church, I think someday we'll stop talking about the pandemic, I suppose. But among the latest arrivals are those who once served in the church and no longer serve. And that may be some of us today. Now again, you're here. I'm preaching to the proverbial choir, as it were. You, you're back. And many of us never left and we're ready. We believe that this is our moment. This is the Kairos moment for us. This is our time. But I just want to challenge you as your pastor. Could it be that God's calling you? Yes, way to go, you're back. He's calling you to serve. And some of you serve in areas you've never served in before. Particularly among our Gen Z, our next generation, I should say. Preschool, children, students, students camp coming up this summer. All of our uh, VBS is coming. We need all of us to be pouring into the next generation. And God's calling some of you to do that. And maybe that's the call today before we even, uh, before we even approach the text. Because we can't stay in this place of apathy and indifference. And one of the ways to trigger greater love for the Lord and his church is to get involved. Some of you need to join the church today is what he's calling you to do. So if I were to ask you, what is your favorite song of all songs? Many of us, like I've done this all week long in different groups, many would say it's the 23rd Psalm. And so we're going to go there today, maybe probably the most known, most loved Psalm of all time, and maybe a surprising Psalm to run to, but you'll see why it fits for our topic today of indifference and apathy. Uh, It hit me this week while I was studying this passage yet again, I thought, wow, I've preached this, taught this. Um, encourage people by this passage, myself included, more than any other passage in all of Scripture. Did so again this past Thursday at a, at a funeral, often at a graveside or at a memorial service. And we had a service here in this room and always drawing comfort, uh, particularly for those who, the family members and others who are here left behind as others are with the Lord. But today we're going to see in Psalm 23, 
The way out of spiritual apathy and indifference is to know the shepherd. We need a renewed vision of the shepherd, many of us. It's to follow his path. It's to seek his presence and then finally to trust his promises. And so let's look at first, know the shepherd as we look at verse one. You know this well, it's already been read today. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. There's an interesting Hebrew construction there. The Lord is my shepherd. I I need not. I need nothing. I don't need a thing. Why? Check out the inflection that helps us understand this passage. David is saying, the Lord is my shepherd. Like, are you kidding me? I don't need anything. Do you know who the Lord is? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. You see, the, this whole passage is about the Lord. The Bible's not about you. Do you know that? Now, when we read it, we often do, and it's about me. Then we make applications that are not in the text. This passage, yes, it's, 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 too, it's encouraging, it's comforting, all the things that we pray will be for you today. But this is not about the sheep. This is about the shepherd. Because you see, if, if you're a hired hand, you're going to grow bitter. If you're a leader, you're going to grow weary. But if you're a sheep, then everything you need is supplied for you. Which makes you want to stay close to the good shepherd. The problem is some of us have, some, how about this? Some of us don't know the shepherd. And no wonder we live lives of anxiety and struggle. We, we don't know what to make of all the, the darkness in the world. But David is saying in this analogy, I am a sheep. I'm a sheep. You see, the shepherd loves his sheep. And though even, even though we might be apathetic towards him at times, he's never apathetic towards us. And we know a lot more than David knew, don't we? Because The shepherd has come and revealed himself to us. The Lord has come in Jesus Christ who says to us in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. You might remember we walked through this passage not too long ago. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We know who the good shepherd is. We don't have to guess and wonder what does he look like or how does he act? What does he feel about us? Jesus, throughout that John 10 passage, um, Spurgeon notes, he rejoices in the fact that he is the good shepherd. He repeats it as a refrain over and over again. He congratulates himself that he is the good shepherd. I am. He rejoices in the fact that he is the good shepherd. And this is remarkable because, well, sheep, right? Right? And we've had a good laugh about how sheep aren't that smart and all those things. But listen, this is an amazing thing. That his love for us is triggered by our, even by our wandering. Even though we may be apathetic towards him. And he says, my sheep hear my voice. They know me and they know my voice. Do you know him today? And the challenge for many of us. Are you putting yourself in position to hear from him? Are you in his word? You're here today. Praise be to God. Continue to be faithful and to serve him and and to give to his mission. To be all in. To know the shepherd every single day that we wake up. Tomorrow, this afternoon. When you wake up tomorrow, our number one goal, friends, in all of life should be, I want to know the good shepherd today. Lord, I want to know you. What we need, friends, is to recapture a vision of who our shepherd is. That's the way out of apathy and indifference. That's what shakes us up. Do you know him today? Many of us need to refocus our minds and our hearts on who Jesus really is. And as we capture a vision of who he is, the good shepherd, we have a renewed vision of his love for us, primarily. As his love captures us, we respond as, as an act of worship. So we have this greater affection than any other affection. That's what we need. And we talk about this often. It's a singular affection that dominates all other affections in our lives. 
Augustine is the one who describes sin as love out of order. Disordered love is our problem. See, love is not our problem. Some have said, uh, someone said, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. You see this in relationships, but we see it in our walk with the Lord as well. Our problem is not love, it's that we don't love enough. Or no, how about this? Our greatest loves often are fixated on lesser things than the good shepherd. And this is why then everything is out of order. And what happens is we run to these other things that really are idols in the end. We think they're going to satisfy us, right? And we run from one to another. My job will bring all the purpose and and such that I need. Ah, not so much. Need a new job. Oh, my spouse. If I only got married, I'd be happy. No, no. New house, new, maybe a new outfit. That would make me feel better about myself. I need to go shopping is what I need to do. We, see, we run to all kinds of things. And in our right minds here in worship today, in his sanctuary, we, we know those things never provide for us. But they can lead to apathy. Because we'll try one after another. That didn't work. That didn't work. Need a new job. Need a new spouse. Need a new family. Wish I had new kids. I need a new house. None of those things will provide for us. Only the good shepherd, only as we have a clear vision of the good shepherd. And watch this, primarily his love for you over and over again. Lord, remind me of how much you love me. You got to know the shepherd. And that's why you're here today. Every day, keep coming back to that reality. Know the shepherd. Then there's three implications that I want you to see today. Then, next one, we follow his path. Look at verse three. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Now, there's an interesting twist here in the Hebrew structure. We often attach, he restores my soul, okay, with the previous grouping. Makes sense. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Boom. But restores my soul is actually attached to the following phrase. He restores my soul as he leads me in paths of righteousness. When I follow him in paths of righteousness, he restores my soul. That's how the restoring comes. As I pursue and follow the good shepherd. You see, we become indifferent and apathetic when we're not following, walking with the shepherd. That should be a sign for you. Like, how am I not following the shepherd? I've forgotten how much he loves us. Uh, Oswald Chambers, he wrote this. Continually restate to yourself what the purpose of your life is. The destined end of man is not happiness, not health, but holiness. So what does holiness look like? It looks like the good shepherd. It looks like Jesus. So we stay in close proximity to him. As we walk with him, we know him. We know him through scripture. We're in his word. We have a clearer vision of who he is. And we follow him in paths of righteousness. He is the righteous one who makes us righteous. Someone said, aim for holiness and you get happiness. Aim for happiness and you get neither. See, the way that your soul is restored out of spiritual apathy and indifference is to turn back to the shepherd. Everything recalibrates back to the shepherd. Your goal in life is not happiness. We've talked about this before. The paradox of hedonism says that you will find happiness by pursuing happiness. When in reality, happiness comes, it ensues, it follows. It's the result of following after something or someone else. That sounds explicitly Christian. As we follow Jesus, happiness instead, we know, is not pleasure. Happiness comes as we pursue holiness. And the good shepherd embodies holiness. So we pursue him. His righteousness then covers us and we become more and more like him. It's the process of sanctification. Walking beside and with our good shepherd. The sheep know the shepherd and they hear his voice and they follow him. Thirdly, look at this. Seek his presence. We know the shepherd. We follow his path and we seek his presence in verse 4. Even through the darkest moments of our lives. And here's why I want you to pause. I had you uh, reference or or, or look at this earlier today. What are you walking through today? 
I'm aware, I'm looking at faces here. I'm aware that some of us are walking through the hardest moments of our lives. I've talked to um, one of our members this morning who I called this weekend knowing that his, fa- his mother is about to pass away. Talked to another member earlier awaiting some results of surgeries and biopsies and friends of the people sitting around you right now have struggles and, and troubles that you don't know about. And every time we gather, we all are struggling in some way. What are you, what are you dealing with? What dark things are you facing today? Let the word of God encourage you. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. You see that? Why is he not afraid? Because the shepherd, because the good shepherd, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Notice he's walking through. He's not walking around. He's not walking under. He's not going over. He's walking through. Notice he's walking, not running, not crawling. There's a sense of one confidently walking. How can you be confident when you're walking through the valley, the shadow of death? You're with the shepherd. You're holding on to the shepherd. Even better, he's holding on to you. Are you walking with him in these days? Are you abiding in him? What are you going through right now? And the the great question, are you walking with confidence through it because you are with the good shepherd? This past uh, week, as I noted, we had a funeral uh, here of an incredible uh, young woman, uh, Kellison Snow, who was 44 years old. A teacher who impacted so many people, just her personality was such that she impacted, there were probably a thousand people here. And many of them, I noticed as we were walking through uh, pre-service, I knew there'd be a lot of young people here. Uh, She has nieces and nephews and a lot of really young, I mean like preteen types, who were here. And, And then a lot of young women in particular. And I knew that coming in. So I wondered, how could I speak to um, the nieces and nephews, the children who would be here. It was unusual to have that many children at a, at a funeral. And I remember the story of Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was a pastor in Philadelphia for many years. And his wife died when he was young, um, a young father. And he had a daughter who was young. She was probably preteenish, kind of 10 years old when, when her mom died. And so Barnhouse, looking for opportunities to help her understand and all the questions that come with that. And he was with his daughter and they were driving along uh, in a car and um, a big moving truck, moving van came past them and came really close to him. It was a little alarming. And the shadow of the big truck just cast over them. And, and he said, wow, uh, what was that? And she, no, it was that big truck, it was the shadow of the truck. And he said, well, let me ask you, would you rather be hit by the truck or by the shadow? She said, well, the shadow, of course, because the shadow can't hurt you. And he said, that, that, that's exactly right. He said, your, your mom, your mom was hit only by the shadow. She didn't get hit by the truck. As it, as it passed, it just went right over us. Only the shadow went over your mom. And then he went on. He said, she's actually alive more than we are alive right now. Because 2,000 years ago, the real truck of death hit Jesus. Jesus allowed himself to be crushed by the truck so that we would only have to face the shadow. And the shadow is actually the, the door. It's the entrance into glory. It's the entrance into the light, which is eternity with him. But you see, for those of us who are here today, who do not know the Lord, you don't know the good shepherd. And if you have any questions around that, you need to settle that before you leave today. But we, even those of us who do know, we can be prone to, to grow apathetic or indifferent. Some of us, even as we get older, we often say it, you either get bitter or you get better based on the trust that you have in a good shepherd. 
Because many of us, we know this, we face it all the time. Death is the great enemy. No one can avoid it. That's why I often think every one of us should go to a funeral about once a week. Because you'll be reminded of the fact that this life is temporal and you'll be reminded that death will defeat you. I mean, this body, you're going to die. None of us can avoid it. And the whole human race as a whole can't not fear death. It's the great enemy in the end. And modern secularism has no answer for it except just try to deny it. And we could fall into that too because, you see, we die a thousand deaths over a lifetime, don't we? And many of us try to push it back. We, we try, to, try to do whatever we can to avoid it. We'll exercise, stay healthy as best we can, maybe walk through procedures or surgeries to, to, to try to fend off aging. Can't do it. And it should remind us all the time. Tim Keller, he writes this, rather than living in fear of death, we should see death as spiritual smelling salts that'll wake us up to the false belief that we will live forever. And then he he writes this, when you are at a funeral, especially one for a friend or a loved one, listen to God's speaking to you. Listen to his voice, telling you that everything in life is temporary except his love for you. This is reality. And friends, this is what should dominate our lives always. So I will fear no evil. Sheep who are with the good shepherd have nothing to fear. Not even death itself. That's what David is telling us. Think of the worst thing you can possibly think of and you don't have to fear a thing. It's why we can live, friends, listen, as as the non-anxious presence in the world. While everybody else is freaking out, we can be walking confidently with our good shepherd without fear. And people wonder if we're living in another world. And we can say, you know, actually I am. I'm living in another kingdom and I have another king. Because you see, the only way that a shadow impedes your progress is fear. We're not afraid. And we will face the seismic shifts that are taking place in our culture with confidence. Because the Lord is with us, the good shepherd. Are you abiding in him? What does that look like? Well, look at this. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Don't miss this. His tools are extensions of who he is. Think about that. The rod conveys uh, the concept of power and authority, even discipline. And and then his staff represents long-suffering kindness that he has towards us. The staff is a long stick, often a slender stick, even with a hook on it. And he just kind of guides the sheep back over to where they need to be. Don't miss this. His tools are to guide us, sometimes discipline us, and to comfort us and to keep us close to him. What are those tools? What tools do we have that bring guidance and comfort? Sounds a lot like the word of God, doesn't it? Are you in it? Are you reading his word? Daily. We read Psalm 23 last Sunday. We're reading through the Psalms, right? Are you, are you doing that? It's simple. And so if you're a member of the church, I've said it, as your pastor, that's what we're doing as a church family. That's what we do together. We're walking together in his word. Be in his word. Pray throughout the day. Have specific times where you pray. Abide in him because the tools that he's given you are drawing him to drawing you to himself. What other tools might we have? Worship together. The the body of the church, community, connect groups, relationships with one another, missions, giving to the mission of the church. All of these are tools to guide us, discipline us, and comfort us. And he's doing that in your life today. Will you respond to him? Know the shepherd. Follow his path. Seek his presence, especially in the dark times. And then finally trust his promises. In verse five, it says, you prepare a table for me before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Look at this. David views himself. This is the picture of 
of one who is seated as an honored guest with someone else who's serving them. Can you imagine the Lord's meal? And his, and his enemies are presented as those who are, are just captive onlookers. He's seated, again, with great confidence and rest, a non-anxious presence. Why? Because the Lord is with him. And the Lord is the one who has set up the table. This banquet before him. We talked about how the, the, the shepherd, as he continues the sheep shepherd analogy, we, we saw it in the Middle East, or in the, in the Holy Land when we were there. The, the, the shepherds out in the field would build these little, um, little enclosures out of rock, whatever they could find, stones. And the sheep would go in. There'd often no longer, ne- never be a gate because the shepherd would lie down and protect the sheep as if to say, over my dead body will you come and take over one of my sheep. Jesus says, I'm the gate. I'm the one who has laid down his life for you. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Friends, are you trusting in his grace? Do you trust in his promises? He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Are you trusting in him? He says, I will always be with you. I'll give you wisdom when you need it. Just ask and I'll I'll freely give. Are you trusting in his promises? He says, all things work together for good. Whatever you're going through today. All things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And then we leave off Romans 8, 29, the next verse. What's his purpose? To conform us into the image of his son. To be like the good shepherd Jesus. Know the shepherd, follow his path, seek his presence, trust in his promises. Look at the result. Verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now this word surely in in the Hebrew is interesting. It's a simple word. Ak is the word. Ak. And it means, it does mean surely. It means definitely. But it can be translated only. And and, and it's it's an interesting construction. Again, it's a restrictive force. um, An emphatic word. Which means that it's contrasting what was preceded it. And then emphasizing what's following. And here's what it is. Look, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I've got enemies all around me. I've got struggles in this life, but surely only goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Wait, even in the dark days? Yes. Even when I get the diagnosis of a disease that I did? Yes. Even when I'm at a graveside of a loved one? Yes. Even when I don't think I can keep on, yes. Even when I'm apathetic and indifferent towards God, yes, he's running after you today. Goodness and mercy is running after you, following you all the days of our lives, friends. He is with you today. And this eschatological promise should guide our hope every single day. It's what N.T. Wright calls theological um, theological jet lag. I love that. What he means is we find ourselves in a dark place, if you will, but we're now in a time zone where we know the light is already shining. So a a couple months ago, Stacey and I went to see uh, our daughter, Emily, and she and Luke live out in California. And so what I did, what I always do on the plane, I'm like, okay, wait, what time is it there? I'm going to go ahead and set my watch and I actually have a watch that just tells time. I mean, that, that's all I've got. So I, I'm changing my watch and, um, and I change it to, uh, to the time where we're heading. Different time zone, like two hours earlier, right? Because when I get there, you see, my clock is already set. Watch this. As Christians, friend, the moment you come to Christ, we have already reset our clocks for another time zone. It may be dark, but we're simultaneously living in a life that that is ultimately going to see the light come and his light is shining upon us. That's what it is to live in the kingdom of God. We live in a different time zone because it may be dark, but we know that the sun is already risen and we now can live in this world with major disruptions, with all kinds of seismic shifts, even walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We will fear no evil 
because God Almighty, our good shepherd, is with us. Friends, you can live with confidence this week. You can be a witness in this world that needs desperately to see those who are clinging to the good shepherd, who look like the good shepherd. And so as we close our time, I want to pray over us and I want to challenge us all to give our lives fully to him. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this amazing uh, song, how it's brought comfort into our lives many times over. And friend, if you're here today and you don't know the Savior, you don't know the Good Shepherd, you need to give your life to him right now. Just say yes to him. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've been wandering off. Many of us have done so. Being devoured by the wolves out in this world. Lord, guide us, all of us to you today. And just just receive his grace. Say, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. For being the good shepherd that lays down his life for us. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for a renewed vision of who you are today. And we give you our lives. Be our vision. You be the central focus and vision of our lives. Nothing that you are not, but all that you are. Bring clarity as we read your words, we follow you, our good shepherd, in whose name we pray. Amen.